to stormingo.net, uh, an innovative way of doing interviews, and we, we have been doing some great interviews. We, we're doing um, guys in politics, we're dealing with guys in church, we're dealing with guys in history, uh, we're dealing with street, we're dealing with all issues, all subjects. We're not going to leave unstone unturned. Um, through this segment, I have the distinct honor to um, interview a person who was the first black mayor of the city of Wilmington, Delaware, here in our state. His, his name is the Honorable Mayor James Seals. How you doing, Honorable? Fine, Norman. Thank you for having me on your program. You know, Mayor, um, I still have to call you Mayor. You know, I'm getting okay. used to it. Um, when, when you were at this, um, I would say ribbon cutting, they were honoring a building in your name. And what I didn't know was how you got to Delaware. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, I had, uh, in 1959, I got a master's degree from Atlanta University. And um, the family court of the state of Delaware offered me a job. It was the first job I offer that I received, and I took it right away. Mm -hmm. I had just got married, maybe a couple of years, year and a half. I had one child, my son Jimmy, who was a little bit over a year old. And so I came to Delaware not knowing a soul. Mm -hmm. Had never been to Wilmington. I'm not even sure I had heard of Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have never heard of that name. <laughs> yeah. But I came here, I came early to find a place for my wife and one child. And I've told a story before. Um, I got off the train and I asked the red cap, uh, hey, I'm new in town. Can you give me some leads on where I might go to find a place to stay? And he said, well, you ought to go up to the Walnut Street YMCA because there are a lot of people up there who know other people and who could probably help you find a place to stay. And I went to the Walnut Y. Luckily they referred me to a lady who had retired, a school teacher who had retired, who lived in the 1300 block of Tatnall Street. Uh, her name was Rosa Bridges. She was um, an angel of a person. She took me in, I sent for my family, and I stayed with Rosa for nearly two years until I could uh, save up enough money to make a down payment and a security down payment mm -hmm. on an apartment. Uh, I tell that story because uh, uh, I feel fortunate that uh, this city has blessed me in many ways. Uh, and entrusted me with a lot of leadership responsibilities over the over the years and uh, I look back on I came here in 1959 didn't know a single soul ended up being the mayor of the city and, and I'm glad you brought that up I'm glad you brought that up that's my second because we're going to jump around on, on this interview what similarities did you see if any with you being the first black mayor and some of the hardships and some of the challenges and a guy like Barack Obama being the first black president. Do you see any similarities at all in you guys' tenure or what he's going through and what you had to go through? Yeah, I think there are some similarities. Obviously, his job is much more difficult than that. mine was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think being the first African-American mayor or being the first African-American leader of almost anything. Mm -hmm. People are unduly critical mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to attribute any mistake you make mm -hmm. to the fact that you're black. Mm -hmm. They are less inclined to be objective, less inclined to um, to consider other factors that might have contributed to a particular problem or problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, uh, I think uh, uh, the president is going through, and has for the last six years or so, experienced a lot of negative reaction from the public. 
largely because he's black, and many people don't want to see him in that position right. to begin with, are inclined to um, attribute any problem that he has to the, to the matter of race. And, and, and while we're on this subject, right, did you feel like sometimes you had to be better, and did you think sometimes that the black community wanted you to do some things that they wouldn't expect from a white man? I wanted more. You understand? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a good question. I think, uh, and I think all mayor, all former black mayors have experienced the problem of uh, uh, expectations beyond what a mayor can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, mayors, black mayors, became black folks became mayors of cities towards the end of the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and people expected mayors to be um, the new advent of, social, of civil rights and expected mayors to uh, make major uh, civil and social changes in our cities. Mm -hmm. And there were expectations beyond those that uh, could be realized by African-American mayors. Mm -hmm. Most of the African-American mayors that were elected, uh, beginning with Carl Stokes in mm -hmm. Cleveland, mm -hmm. uh, uh, came to be mayors of cities that were almost defunct. Uh, not defunct, but um, they were struggling, had financial problems. Mm -hmm. so a lot of the uh, middle class and professional people had left cities, mm -hmm. in part because of the racial unrest of the 60s. Uh, cities had uh, inadequate tax bases mm -hmm. uh, and um, just had difficulty, mayors had difficulty uh, effecting real social change mm -hmm. because they didn't have and still do not have mm -hmm. sufficient economic resources. You know, I'm going I'm to ask you a couple of questions because you, you have a vast variety of experience from the social service, that's your backgrounds, right? right. Um, politics and economics and uh, all this. We, we had, a, I had a young man here who was my nephew, and he was talking about in 98 when he caught charges, and he was catching charges in 92, 93 when we went into office. Does it pain you to see how many of our young black men we're losing to street violence? And what is the cure? I mean, what do you think we're not doing right? Or what do you think we're doing wrong? No, that's a tough question, and it, it requires a lot of different answers. Um, for one thing, um, we don't have good school systems, not adequate school systems in our urban communities, and young people are not uh, getting the kind of educational skills that can lead them to being employable and getting entering the job market uh, and that that failure of our educational system has contributed to young folks uh, becoming involved in drugs and violence and, and other illicit kinds of activities so there's a connection between the failure of our educational system and the upsurge of uh, of violence and crime, right. but there, but there are also some other things. Uh, um, there's been a cultural change, mm -hmm. I think, in the last 15 or 20 years, compared to many years ago when you and I were teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, young people are, are faced with a cultural, a culture in which there is. Um, a feeling of instantaneous success. Mm -hmm. um, there's a belief that uh, increasingly so, based on videos that are put out, music that's put out, uh, movies that are put out, um, there's less of an understanding on the part of young people of the need to plan, to have goals and objectives, mm. to work towards those objectives 
over a span of time. There's a feeling that things got to, people have to have success right away. Hmm. They have to achieve a certain level of security and stability and financial uh, success right away. Mm -hmm. Well, life is not that way. You've got to work at it. You've got to plan for it. Um, but our young people, too many of our young people, um, look for instant achievement, instant success. Some of that has to do with the cultural environment in which they've, they were living in, as I've cited. Some of it has to do with not getting adequate parental direction mm -hmm. uh, and not getting enough tough love from our parents. I think our parents, uh, parents need to monitor the activities and behavior of young people more stringently than they have been doing. Let me go back to education for one second. Um, do, what role do you think you said the segregation play? Do you think that it's been good or bad for our communities? Um, and which way is good, which way is bad? Uh, Norman, I think that's a question that is yet to be answered. Uh, there is a value, we think, in young people, black and white, going to school, uh, interacting with each other, uh, gaining respect for each other across racial and cultural lines. Education has a way of preparing young people to live in a democracy, to have re greater respect for racial difference. In that sense, I think school desegregation has had some success. Mm -hmm. At the same time, school desegregation has contributed in many cities to more segregation hmm. because many people, white people in particular, professional people, middle income people, have moved out of the cities and many of our schools and most, in many of our urban areas have mostly resegregated schools. In that sense, desegregation has not worked. It has not brought about uh, the kind of racial and social class diversity that was expected. Uh, Mayor, um, we, we've been talking about a lot of things and, and, and we were hitting on education and how deseg played a role or whatever. Um, and you also hit on some things as far as younger blacks in order for them to get involved with the mainstream and making money, getting a good job, getting better educated. This young man on here, again, I keep referring back to his interview, he was saying, we gotta catch him at a younger age. He said, by the time he got 12, became 12, he knew a lot. He said, by the time he became 14, he was having a kid. So, what do you say? I mean, that's why I said, is the, is the educational system kind of broke? Um. Or is that too harsh? I think it's easy to say that the educational systems, systems in our urban communities are broken. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of deficiencies that exist mm -hmm. that don't lead to young folks getting basic and sound education that prepares them to have skills to go out and into the world of work. So we've got a lot to do to fix the educational systems. Um, but there's also a lot that the black community has got to do. Mm -hmm. you know, we can't blame entirely the school system. Mm -hmm. We've got to take better ownership of our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, civic groups and professional groups need to become more involved, mm -hmm. need to provide better direction need to take ownership of our kids and not expect governmental programs to address our problems. Mm -hmm. Can't expect governmental programs to keep our kids from dropping when, out of school. When, when you say that people say you sound conservative, are you moving more towards Republicans? No, I don't think so. I, think that I don't either. I believe it. I, I mean, I agree with you, by the way. There's a role to play uh, in terms of governmental support and governmental involvement in solving social problems. And we deserve our fair share 
of financial resources and our fair share of progressive public policy. And government, that's, that's a goal of government. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've got to take more self-responsibility. We, meaning the black community, black parents, uh, black organizations, we've got to do more to provide support for our young people. You said something early on. You said when you got here in the 50s, uh, 57, I think you said. Did you see more of that then than you see now? I think we do now. I came here in 1959. Uh, I'm a Kappa brother like you are, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the fraternities and sororities um, got involved largely by providing scholarships to students who were already motivated, number one. Mm -hmm. But now um, fraternities and sororities are doing some things going beyond that. Mm -hmm. Our Kappa fraternity just finished building a, mm -hmm. a community center mm -hmm. over on uh, uh, Vanderbilt Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been unheard of 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, our brothers were charged a certain fee, mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. dollar amount they had to pay mm -hmm. to help build that, that uh, center. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it, it's indicative of, of, the, of the fraternity doing something to change the infrastructure of the community. We're going beyond simply giving scholarships to kids, although that's very important. What about the basic infrastructure in general? I, I know you have some concerns about the way cities are. Well, there are a lot of infrastructure problems that are not being addressed because uh, there's not much of a constituency out there for them to be addressed. We've got in this city, and Wilmington is not unique, we've got in this city miles and miles of sewer pipes and water pipes that are 150 years old and need to be replaced. We have water main breaks every now and then that cost 300 to 400,000 to fix. Uh, we are supposedly, in terms of our budget, replacing a certain number of miles of water mains and sewer main pipes, but we aren't doing it because we don't have the money. So we have underground infrastructure problems that aren't being addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have bridges uh, all over the country that have serious defects that aren't being addressed. Uh, we have in our neighborhoods houses that, many of our neighborhoods that have road type houses have houses that are 150 years old or older. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got some basic infrastructure problems uh, that don't get a lot of visibility because there aren't elected officials pushing for those kinds of things mm -hmm. because there's no public demand for them. They're underground, they're non visible. Mm -hmm. But they're real problems that uh, and I think President Obama is seeking to do th something about it at the national level. He's been pushing Congress to allocate uh, mega billions and billions of dollars to better address our roads. Uh, our bridges, uh, these the infrastructure, the uh, infrastructure problems connected with our sewer systems, our water systems. But those are problems that, that are there and aren't being addressed right now, uh, effectively. Man, let me ask you um, one last question. Um, you've been charged or been in a number of leadership roles from NWCP, People Settlement, first African American Mayor, State Representative, worked as a tenure professor. If you look back and want to do something different, or is there anything that you regret, or is there anything that you would do differently than what you've done? And what is one of the most proud moments? I guess it's, so it's kind of two questions. Well, I've done some things that I regret. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can say it on camera, you don't have to say it on camera. Uh, uh, Norm, uh, the thing, one, one thing that I'm most proud of, uh, is my role with DCRAC, the Delaware Community Reinvestment Action Council. That was a banking community advocacy group that I established back in 1987. We went on to challenge the redlining practices of a number of, a number of banks in Wilmington. Got three banks to sign contractual agreements to provide uh, loans 
at a discount of mortgage loan, business loans to people in low income neighborhoods. Wow. We even got one bank, Old Delaware Trust, we said you need to have your staff more accessible to people. They sent several of their staff per e so many evenings a week to work at people's settlements so mm -hmm. they could be more accessible to people who needed financial services. We even got the banks to agree to put women and minorities on their boards. That's big. Now I look back on that period of time from 87 to 93 when I became mayor in 93 as probably one of the most successful things that I've done as a leader. Okay. Uh, and I, I look back on that with a lot of pride. Well, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your time. Prison is designed to tear individuals apart. Why do you say that? Because I believe, just the way it's structured, I believe prison is designed, for example, if we go to, if you come visit me in prison, I, that, that procedure and everything that you have to go through in order to come see me, uh, and the way different things are structured in prison. I believe it's designed for you to say, you know what, man, I'm not going back down there and seeing Sadiq no more. Because I just had to go through too much. You know, the dude, he pat me down and I got to get serious and it's a wall and I have to be down there an hour before the visit and it's just too much hassle.